Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 129 of the Thick Bootcamp podcast. The title of today's interview is Holistic, an interview with Dr. Tiffany Brownbush. My name is Richard Johansson. And I'm Matt Sabatella. So Matt, we named this episode Holistic because we've never interviewed anyone, certainly any doctor, who had the diversity of qualifications to treat someone with Lyme disease. Dr. Brownbush not only is a Lyme herself, but she is a naturopathic doctor and she has more qualifications and certifications to deal with the whole person, not just the physical person, but the emotional person and the spiritual person than anyone else we've ever interviewed. Rich, what I found so amazing about Dr. Brownbush is that she was so qualified to treat Lyme disease even before she got sick. Then once she got sick, she was able to take what she learned from her chronic illness and turn it into an opportunity to help others suffering from chronic Lyme disease. So Matt, I think what's really cool about Dr. Brownbush's story is she used all of these vast qualifications that she's developed to treat the whole person, to not only treat her whole person and her patient's whole person, but she also had to treat her husband. So there are so many insights that we gained here that we've never gained before. And I'm really excited to introduce Dr. Tiffany Brownbush to the Thick Boot Camp community. Hi, Dr. Tiffany Brownbush, and welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Well, we're really blessed to have you, and we thank you for accepting our invitation to join us on the podcast. So, Dr. Tiffany, is, is that how we should refer to you? Do your patients refer to you as Dr. Tiffany? They do, and that, that's totally comfortable with me. My last name is a mouthful, so. <laughs> yes, so, that, so it'll be a lot easier for me to uh, call you Dr. Tiffany than it will be Dr. Brownbush. So yes. let's, um, let's, let's talk about where you are right now. Where, where do you live? Oh, I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. And how long have you been in Charlotte, North Carolina? Oh my gosh, it's been about since 1997 or so. It's been a while. And what do you do there for a living? Right. So I am a naturopathic therapist. So um, that's what I call myself because it's hard to explain exactly all that I do. <laughs> so, but I'm a naturopathic doctor and a mental health therapist. So I'd like to walk back to your childhood and where you grew up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I started, because I'm a military brat, so I started in Texas, um, so that's where I was born, uh, and then um, I went back and forth between my, my family in Texas and my family in North Carolina, uh, so my grandparents would take care of me, and I'd go back and forth. My mom divorced my father when I was younger, so I would go back and forth between my grandparents and my moms, and then at 10, we moved overseas. Okay, where'd you live when you were overseas? We were in Germany. So from the time I was 10 until I graduated from high school, I was in Bamberg, Germany. And do you speak German as well? Nein, sprechen Sie Deutsch. That's all I can say, because I don't speak Deutsch. <laughs> so, um, Dr. Tiffany, when did you first start to show the symptoms of what you now know to be your tick disease? Right. Um, it was abundantly clear because I, I struggle with this a little bit as I, I think many of the people you've interviewed do. Um, it was abundantly clear in 2016, at the very beginning of 2016, but I often wonder if some of the things I struggled with from 2010 until then, till 2016, may have been something as well. And so where were you professionally in 2010? Meaning what types of things were you pursuing in 2010 when you think you may have first started to see the symptoms of your tick disease? Right. So at that time, I was, um, I was in college. I was in grad school. No, is that right? Hold on. So I've done so much education. I was in grad school, um, finishing grad school to become a mental health therapist. And I also was running, I had been running for a while at that point, a fitness studio, nutrition counseling. Um, so I was deep in wellness at that time and um, had a personal relationship with a client that was a gastroenterologist. That was my, just to give you some framework, my gastro was a client that I needed that much access to her at that time. So I was having a lot of digestive problems even then. So Dr. Tiffany, one of the things that I really appreciate about you shortening your name for us is, uh, is that it's easier for me to refer to you as Dr. Tiffany. But even more importantly, you have more letters after your name than you had before your long name because you have so yes. much education. So let's go through your educational background because I think it's really important for us to have that context for you. And then I want to come back to 2010. So talk to us about where you went to college and, and what type of uh, graduate studies you've done and then uh, and, and what other types of, um, of uh, uh, certifications have you gotten in the wellness community? Right, so hopefully this doesn't extend the interview. <laughs> 
beyond what is appropriate. So um, I love to learn. So let's just go ahead and, and put that out there. Which is um, very clear. Yes. Okay. And so I graduated high school in three years as valedictorian. So there was a setup here for this experience. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's, I'm really good at this. There are a lot of things I'm not good at. Um, so I, um, I did undergrad at UNC Charlotte. Um, I was a, I majored in psychology and I had a double minor in communication studies and women's studies. So there was, I was very kind of clear on the direction now in high school. I thought I would become an attorney, but as real life started to hit, I figured out what I wanted to do with myself. I wanted to help people. Um, I went immediately to grad school um, and uh, I went online I, because at that point I, I was, um, I was already in IT. So it was a, it was a, we will not go down that path, but I, I did uh, my grad school online at that time through Capella with um, some of these kind of um, satellite locations where you'd go and do in-person training. Uh, so I became a licensed mental health counselor um, with a specialization in eating disorders. I was really interested in working with people with eating disorders, um, body image, and just women, just with a focus on women and just what women do in their heads and, and with their bodies and those types of things. It was really a, an interest of mine. Um, but as this was happening, as I was going through grad school, I had started, I had left IT and gone into fitness. And so certifications would include, include fitness certifications. I had created a nutrition program that was approved through the Dietetic Board in North Carolina because I kept realizing that as I was working in wellness, the clients that I was working with needed more and more. So I kept trying to create different things. Um, along the road there, I became a functional diagnostic practitioner. So an FDNer, I trained under Dr. Kalish um, and just hormones and, and um, uh, just functional medicine. Um, Sarah Gottfried, I, I trained in one of her programs uh, to understand um, female hormones better. Um, and then somewhere in there, um, I, I was just racking up numerous mental health certifications and things like that. I decided I wanted to become a traditional naturopath because I needed to better understand how to, to get, functional medicine was great and I love functional medicine. I love all the labs I get to run, um, but there's basic things that people have lost sight of doing and traditional naturopathy talks about sun and water and sleep and uh, the power of herbs and flowers. And, and I, I just wanted to understand um, how, to, how to do wellness from that perspective. And so at that point, I embarked on uh, the journey with uh, the Trinity School of Natural Health. And that's how I became a naturopath. Um, during all of that, I'll try to speed this up. I fell in love with Dr. Amon's work. I got to meet him at an integrative mental health conference where um, um, Great Plains Laboratory, it puts on this, this and everybody there's amazing and I just fan out over everyone and I got to meet him and he said, you know, you need to do my certification for, because at that point I was a therapist, you need to do my certification, I think you'd like it and I became a brain health coach, a pivotal moment for me meeting him and, and getting that certification. Um, and it's kind of continued on that way. There's been more and more, there's functional neurology that I've added now. And I can explain at some point why all these things make sense too. Um, and then environmental illness trainings and so forth. So Dr. Tiffany, while you're on this educational journey, you start to get sick. Now let's, oh, yes. Let's focus on 2010. How is your health impacting a the educational experience that you were in the middle of at that time i think you said you were in graduate school and mm -hmm. b how do you believe that your illness impacted your career path right so from a timeline perspective uh, just to tweak this i finished grad school in 2009 and i was in licensing when i think um all the digestive problems started um and that was really, it was a matter of my blood pressure was always low. So it was always kind of dizzy. And um, like, you know, from seated to standing, I would get really dizzy. Um, the fatigue started and the digestive problems were really, I had to kind of build my day around just kind of um, my IBS is what I, I, I had at that time. 
Um, and that kind of was the biggest issue for a few years was the, you know, managing fatigue and the digestion. But I was training, I was running a business, I had multiple businesses I was running. I was, I had lots of vitality even at that time. I had lots of achiness in my body, but I attributed that to how, um, aggressive my exercise was at the time and I would just manage that with massages um I, I nothing debilitating really at that time okay so talk to us about how your your symptoms began to develop from 2010 forward through 2016 right so I feel like I almost feel like something happened from 20 like 2015 to 2016 like the moment it became 2016 like my body just fell apart <laughs> it's just you know and I was, was it progressive, Dr. Tiffany? Meaning you said in 2010, you were dealing with these issues, uh, but you were able mm -hmm. to manage it or, or self-manage it. How did things, how did things develop? Yeah. So it, it, it doesn't feel progressive when I look back. I just remember, I, I remember the year of 2015 feeling just really energized. And then 2016, what happened is I was teaching a class. I was still teaching very much part-time and my right knee went. And um, I just couldn't teach. I couldn't finish that class. Someone had to come in and, and, and take it over for me. And then I went to see the sports doc. We did an MRI. I need need surgery. And then I'm preparing mentally for the fact that now this is who I am. And um, and then my right knee is all of a sudden fine. And three weeks three weeks later, my left knee is a problem. And I didn't even go back for that knee because I, I said, okay, something's wrong. <laughs> it's just, this doesn't make sense. And it became this issue of, um, it was the knee, this migratory um, joint stuff that was happening, but also um, there were these surges of kind of like cortisol because I knew, I, I felt like I knew what was happening. So I knew it wasn't just a headache. I would get these surges of cortisol in my body where I would have these frontal headaches or I would feel just really shaky if I was in the middle of an interaction with somebody that was a little tense or if I had something that was stressful that would happen, my body was really overreacting. Um, fatigue and, and sleep issues. And that was kind of 2016. So now where were you in your educational experience at that time? Because you've, you've now done a great deal of work in the women's study arena. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're doing, you've done a great deal of work in the hormonal arena. Mm -hmm. right? Where are you educationally and how is that helping you to understand what's happening to you? So I had completed a lot of the functional medicine training at that time. And I was, I was wrapping up my um, training as a naturopath. So I was in the, I was in the, in that phase of it. Um, I kept attributing everything to, um, stress responses and what I was eating and, and um, maybe not recovering well enough or I needed to supplement differently. I kept thinking it was Lyme, Lyme was not on my radar. So I really thought, um, you know, my life was very stressful and I thought I was just getting older and just paying for the stressful lifestyle and I needed to do more of the self-care piece of things that I learned. I was running labs um, my labs just confirmed that I, I had stress and just some hormonal dis dysregulation at that time. So let's talk about Lyme and ticks. Um, mm -hmm. You grew up in North Carolina and Texas uh, and also in Germany. Mm -hmm. What did you know about ticks and Lyme disease, not educationally, but culturally? Mm -hmm. were, were ticks ever an issue? And did you know anything about ticks and tick diseases? My grandmother told me if I had a tick to let her know, because um, I was always playing in the backyard and we always had animals, and uh, don't pull it out, she'd take care of it. That was what I knew about ticks. Do you recall and, ever having been bitten by a tick? And did you ever have to go to your grandmother to have the tick removed? Never, never. Okay. So now let's talk about your educational experience. There are very mm -hmm. few people that have as much education in the wellness arena as you. During mm -hmm. all of these educational experiences that you've had, what did you learn about Lyme and tick diseases? Um, I didn't learn anything about Lyme or tick disease um, until Dr. Amen's program. So that was the place that highlighted it and that was overlapping with the naturopathy training, um, but nowhere else. And even with his work, it wasn't, it was nowhere near enough. So when did you first start to think 
that these symptoms that you had, which were resulting in a crash between 2015 and 2016, were related to a tick disease? It would ultimately take until 2018 and working with the Amen Clinic before I made the connection. So let's talk about what was happening between 2016 and 2018. So, because before I, I turn this interview over to Matt, I'd like to know how your symptoms were developing and right. how it was impacting your personal life and your professional life. Right. So 2016 is very clear to me because I spent, I spent almost $10,000 on physical therapy um, and MRIs and um, I had never had neck pain ever. And I, I just remember that being a, something that I, I, I talked to my massage therapist about. And in 2016, towards the end of summer, the neck pain started to the point where the physical therapy was all of this trigger point therapy on my neck. And it was horribly painful, just really painful therapy. And it wasn't relieving anything. I was getting at, now there was a point in 2016 where I was just getting weekly massages for pain management. And I was always doing Epsom salt baths. So the pain and the inflammation and the weight and the just feeling swollen, that was 2016. 2017 ushered in new symptoms. Um, so everything kind of stayed and then we added an, an extra layer and I just, I started having problems breathing. So I would be in an appointment with someone and I felt like I was suffocating and I would start to get panicky and I, I, I didn't understand what was happening. Um, I couldn't sleep at night. I would sleep until 3 a.m. and I'd be awake. Um, and I was taking, you know, melatonin, I was doing all my things. I was, you know, there was lavender everywhere and I was, just, <laughs> it was all the things you're supposed to do. And I could not sleep beyond 3 a.m. And I was grinding my teeth so badly that the dentist was really freaked out about, you know, what was going on there. Um, and uh, my eyes were super dry all the time and red and um, my cholesterol had shot up. That started in 2016. I had this really high cholesterol. Now, I'm eating paleo and keto and clean keto. And, um, you know, and it doesn't make any sense. I'm exercising all the time still, but I'm having to modify my exercise because things are starting to tear. The end of 2017 to 2018 is where everything started to tear. So my, my elbow and my knee and, and everything's like, really, now I can't exercise and I'm doing bar work and things that are very gentle on the body because um, my body's not responding properly. Every time I'm going to the doctor, it's you're stressed out. It's your, um, you know, you're not resting enough. Um, there's nothing wrong. We can't find anything. Um, it, 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 there's no, there's no direction there. Um, and, and that's kind of what it looked like, you know, through 2018. So let, let's talk about how, this uber healthy young woman um, mm -hmm. is now, um, how, how, how are your developing symptoms impacting you socially? Meaning, socially, right. Yeah, let's, let's talk about you know, who was in your life at that time and how were you failing these people because you were not feeling well? Right, so I, got, I was married in 2014. I got married in 2014. I met my husband and, and um, we were together from about 2010 um, until now. Um, we used to do things. We used to go out. We, we used to just, you know, um, and I felt like over time, I just became more reclusive, a bit of a hermit. We were always tired. Um, and I'm, I say we because I'll include him in this journey at some point here too. Um, but we were always just, I, I wanted to live in sweatpants. You know, it was just this thing that all of a sudden shifted. I just was not the same person. And my anxiety and my anger were unmanageable so i was always on something this shifted jerk from 2015 on where i had to go on supplementation to help me manage the anxiety so 2016 on and then right before my cycles would start i would have unmanageable almost rage and it didn't make sense so i was having to change my work schedule around my menstrual cycles and that was really intense in 2018 um, and then I had to really manage how I, I interacted with my husband because of that. Um, I really, from a personal with friends relationship um, kind of perspective, I just wasn't as available. I just started having less bandwidth. I was always a person you could come to, and I just was not as available to people, especially in 2018. That was where the health 
just really came crashing down. So how did your husband react to the changed uh, Dr. Tiffany that he had been with between 2010 and 2015? And how did he react to you being less available and less capable of participating in the types of athletic and social activities you guys had become accustomed to participating in together? Right. So he, it was hard for him. It was hard for him. It was, um, he did, he didn't miss the social piece, but it was the emotional dysregulation. That was a huge problem in our relationship. Um, and I, I was always the, you know, I was the center. I was the calm and I was not calm. <laughs> it was just, and, um, and we would later realize that somewhere in 2016, he got sick as well. And so he has lab work and I can talk about that, but he got sick around the same time. We changed together. We both became very tired together. So the problem for us and the healing work for us has been the, and we love each other and adore each other and are blessed. And we, we just, you know, we are, uh, we pray together and, and um, we've done a lot of healing. There was just a lot of emotional pain and um, tension during that 2016, 27, those two years were probably the hardest years of our relationship. So would you describe your reaction to your husband, at least when you're angry as Lyme rage? And how was your husband dealing with your Lyme rage when you were angry? Yes, I, I would explain it as Lyme rage for sure, cyclically. Other times of the month I was fine, you know, but, but yeah, cyclically. And um, he didn't understand it and he would, but he, he ultimately was sick with Ehrlichia in 2016. So he started having his own emotional dysregulation as well. And so it just was a very volatile experience. That's really how I would describe it. He didn't handle it well. And, um, and, and we struggled, the two of us, during those two years. Did your Lyme rage and the other emotional challenges that you're facing impact other social relationships, such as such as your relationships with friends and other uh, extended family. Right, it didn't. We, I mean, I, I did a really good job of managing um, with them, but it, it did impact one of. I have a cl very close friend I've had for a very long time, and I I became someone different. It wasn't that I became rageful with her. Um, I couldn't be who I'd been. I you know you're different when you go through so it's like an attack from the inside and you don't know you're under attack or you don't understand what it is and i just knew i had a lot less patience um a lot less patience with people um i changed a lot because these are great questions i changed a lot of what i did work wise i had to start changing the kind of client that i could see there were clients that would have um borderline diagnosis or a, a very intense diagnosis i found them a lot more triggering I couldn't work with them. I just didn't have this the space anymore for some reason. And and like I said, I mean, I, I was being very candid with someone recently. I could look at the calendar and know that if I had a certain certain kind of client with the diagnosis on my calendar right before my cycle, I might not have that same client after after that that day because something would happen with the um, with the connection between us. I couldn't regulate something anymore. And I would get really kind of activated by people. When did you ultimately um, get your diagnosis and how did you ultimately come to your diagnosis of a, of a tick disease? Right, so like I've, I've indicated, 2018 was just so hard. And I had, what ended up happening in 2018 was my digestive tract was almost shutting down. So for the longest time, and my gastro knew this, I was dependent on using, um, uh, like a, a water enema on a regular basis just to keep my gut going. Um, but at the end of, towards, towards the end of 2018, my husband said, this is out of control. So two things happened. I went to the Amen clinic and I said, something's definitely wrong with me. I want, I want a spec scan and I'm, I'm certified and I understand and I've done the whole protocol that you're supposed to do. Um, can you confirm what's going on with my brain? And the second thing that happened was, um, you know, I started really spending a lot of time with the gastroenterologist really trying to figure out what was going on with my gut. My spec scan showed that I had the ring of fire diagnosis, which is the worst presentation on the spec scan. So my actual brain, the tissue was beautiful. She, you know, my psychiatrist said, um, you have a great looking brain. However, your brain is 
severely inflamed. Okay. <laughs> so every brain lobe is completely lit up. What in the world is going on with you? And you're on everything and you're doing the functional medicine doc came in and it's like, I, I, I know what I'm doing. I'm a pro professional, you know, and I can go toe to toe. I'm doing all these things. And he's like, you're doing all the things. So here's what you're not looking at. Cause I, I mean, I had looked at everything. You're not looking at Lyme or mold and the way that your brain is presenting. That's the only explanation at this point, based off of everything that you're doing that could explain this level of inflammation. And that is how I, I got redirected and it even, and I, and as I sat there and they said it, Lyme, I was like, okay, I don't know enough about this to even be clear, but mold, I don't have my mold in my house. You know, there's no way. And that's when my life changed. That's when it changed. So, so do you think because you were a medical professional and you were treating all of the symptoms that it delayed your capacity to get to a Lyme diagnosis? No, I actually don't. That's a good question. I, um, I had asked for the help in the way that I was supposed to, you know, um, and I don't know if I would have had to have gone to a Lyme literate functional medicine practitioner because I, I had worked with a couple of functional med docs previously as well. And they had kind of, you know, helped me. It, it was looking at my brain and seeing that that level of inflammation didn't make any sense based off of my care. I think I needed somebody to look at something deeper than what you could see. But Dr. Tiffany, you, you are exhibiting a lot of very classic Lyme <laughs> symptoms, the air yes. hunger, and, and mm -hmm. the list goes on because you were describing what I would consider as a lay person some very classic Lyme symptoms. Mm -hmm. So why was the diagnosis so delayed, do you think? For example, if it wasn't your professional training, do you think your, your race or your gender played a role in the delay of your diagnosis? Right. Um, that, and that's great. That's a great question. I, I believe that I can walk into a doctor's office right now and because I'm so healthy, and I do partly believe because I am female, okay, I do think that's a part of it, um, I'm disregarded. Uh, even with the digestive complaints, because, you know, I had to really work for years to be taken seriously, um, you have to have a, a diagnosable breakdown somewhere in your system for the medical community to pick up on this. And even now with me having all of my, la my labs and being able to kind of explain what's going on, the doctors that I work with do not acknowledge Lyme. That's, they won't acknowledge Lyme. The, you know, the non-Lyme literate docs won't call this that, even my rheumatologist. So if I say I have labs and I know that this is, this is why I feel the way I do and they won't say it, there's no way they would have said it before when I didn't even know to ask about that. Um, and when I explore what they do know, it is inadequate. You know, it's, it's not enough for them to have been able to have picked it up. If someone had picked up anything, they would have thought I had an autoimmune issue and my labs were coming back clear for autoimmunity. What about your race? Do you think your race played a role in the delay of the diagnosis? Right. Um, and I, 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 I don't know if it played a role in the delay. I think it plays a role in the lack of awareness of Lyme. I think, you know, um, in, in not having other people to talk to, like when I would tell people what I was going through, autoimmunity shows up a lot within my community and people want to talk about that and they'll ask if you've been tested for that. But just as, as a black woman, um, no one talks about it. So I didn't feel like I didn't have access to um, proper medical care. I, I, I feel as if it just wasn't on anyone's radar. And I don't, as a black person, no other black people, you know, who were, knew anything about Lyme to even talk to me about it. Mm -hmm. Dr. Tiffany, as Rich noted, you exhibited a lot of the classic symptoms of Lyme disease before you got diagnosed. So mm -hmm. one of the things I want to ask you to talk more about is this stress response you noted when you first got sick in 2016 with your severe symptoms. So can you describe for our listeners what that was like? You mentioned it was sort of an increase in adrenaline and mm -hmm. it sounds like that was more like the fight or flight reaction that many of us Lyme patients get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, 
it was so surreal. It's you're, you're in your body and your body's always responded one way and now it's doing things that don't make any sense. And I just, I, I ran a lot of groups like group coaching and group therapy and I would have a response to something internally, an internal response like, that's interesting. I don't know if I agree with that, that comment. And, and then all of a sudden the response was almost like I was really angry. Like my body would go from zero to a hundred and I'd have like this flash of just, um, it, it was adrenaline, you know, like the fight or flight response. And I was, and, and I was like, what is happening? This, this adrenaline response and this headache doesn't go with what I actually perceived about this interaction. It was, it was like my body, the physiology was completely overreacting. And that was, it was a frontal headache. It was a, the back of my head would hurt and I would have a, a it would take an hour or two hours to just discharge all of that adrenaline. And at the time with your medical background, did you find anything that helped alleviate these symptoms, even though you didn't know it was Lyme at the time? Right. So 2016 to 2017, I was doing, you know, a, a adrenal support and because, you know, there's this weird response that's happening and then there's this chronic fatigue issue that I'm constantly dealing with. So I was, you know, using a lot of licorice root um, and um, adrenal support herbs and um, B vitamin support, uh, just, just things that could help me manage just manage my, my, my hormones a little bit differently. And do you feel that these actually helped you cut back your symptoms a little bit, or were you seeing really no response to these supplements and treatments that you were doing to help with these symptoms? The level of supplementation that I was on in 2017 going into 2018, there was not enough support. Like I, I was on all of the right amino acid support for what became anxiety. I was meditating and doing yoga and you know i was i was put magnesium oil all over my body like there was nothing that was the symptoms kept getting increasingly worse but i do think if i hadn't been doing any of those things i don't know what I, it would have been like i mean it, i do think it it managed it on some level so i could function but the quality of life i was experiencing was subpar and Dr. Tiffany, moving forward now to 2017, when you described you had your breathing problems, is mm. this similar to what other Lyme patients describe as air hunger? Absolutely. Yes. I, I had the night sweats. I later realized what was going on, right? Because I was having this, these pools of night sweats as well with this. Um, but yeah, that's exactly what it feels like. And it's, and it, it's so scary. It's so scary being in that in your body and you just cannot, you cannot catch your breath no matter what you do. And another, another interesting thing that we learned from you just now is that your Lyme rate seemed to really tick up right before your cycle. And yes. we've interviewed a lot of Lyme patients who said that they've either developed or had worsening endometriosis as a result of Lyme. So mm. from your experience and your you know, practicing as a naturopath, do you think there's a connection between uh, endometriosis and Lyme disease? You know, that's an autoimmunity issue, right? And I think all of these autoimmune issues where the body starts, the body is does not do anything on accident. I think, I think that's, as a naturopath, my prevailing belief is everything is an intentional response to something. And so I, I would say stealth infection, because I think there are all kinds of infections, right? And, and when you, um, like with my own journey here, it, it's been Lyme, but it also with Bartonella and just having different things, your terrain changes, you become more toxic. And I just think it's that whole stealth infection cascade that would contribute to the endometriosis piece. Dr. Tiffany, do you believe that with proper supplementation and herbs and medication that are antimicrobials and immune boosting support, that these symptoms can get better for people that have been suffering for years with severe endometriosis and Lyme rage and this fight or flight mode, you think that there is hope for these people with the proper identification of what they need to do? Absolutely. A, a resounding yes. That's been my experience. So yes. So let's talk more about your diagnosis. So now your, your doctor recommends that the only thing left that could be causing your symptoms based on what you're doing to treat your symptoms is either Lyme or mold. And now let's talk more about the test that you did for Lyme disease and what it was like when you got the results from your doctor or from your self-prescribed, I guess, test that you may have done. Right. So um, 
a beautiful just blessing for me it was at, at that very kind of moment going to 2019 i was uh, was being accepted into the um into ICI, which is an organization for environmentally acquired illness. And so I had a lot of access during that time to just the different things that would make sense for me to do for testing. I, um, I did the traditional Western blot, though I knew it didn't make any sense to do so. I did it and I, you know, I did not have Lyme. I did, um, I ran a Bartonella uh, IgG lab that showed positive. So that's when I got confirmation on Bartonella. I tested for Babesia and I didn't have um, any antibodies. Um, and so I, all of these are all blood work labs. And so I was in a training with Dr. Klinghart and the Sophia Institute. And um, again, just blessed to have access to all these brilliant people. And um, the reason I'd even tested for Bartonella because it, the Amen clinic pointed me the direction, but I was trying to figure out where to go, is um, Dr. Schaffner said, you know, they, they always palpate and look for the kind of the, the string of pearls on the neck. And I, I would always, it had been years of feeling these, these nodules. And I said, okay, I need to test for Bartonella, you know, and I have a lot of the symptoms of Bartonella and I had the just string of pearls and I had all the, the lymph node inflammation. And that's how I, I knew to test for that. Um, but he, the Clean Heart um, Institute and Sophia Institute, they like the DNA Connections Lab. And that's why I did the DNA Connections Lab. And that confirmed um, relapsing Borrelia, uh, Borrelia and um, Ehrlichia. So at this point, we've got Bartonella, we have Lyme, and we have Ehrlichia, um, which I do think both my husband and I picked up in 2016. Um, and I did not get a confirmation of Babesia, but we had air hunger and we had night sweats. So Dr. Tiffany, let's talk more about why these traditional labs didn't come up with the full picture of what you actually had from these tick-borne diseases. And why do you think that DNA connections, which is a urine test rather than a blood test, yeah. is, is looked so negatively at by doctors, right? Because here in New York, it's actually banned. We cannot do a DNA connections test. It's banned by the, by the New York governor. So why do you think that DNA connections is so controversial when it's helped so many people with tick-borne illnesses get a proper diagnosis and help them regain their life back? Right. Um, your first question of why do I think that it, it didn't show up in the traditional labs, it's, it's, it had become chronic Lyme. I mean, you heard my symptoms had gone on for so long. Um, and at that point, you know, um, they had, they had burrowed deeply. They, you know, they were not showing up in my bloodstream. Um, though my, and one thing I didn't mention was my, um, I've been diagnosed with leukopenia, which just means low white blood cells. You can track with my blood work. Um, my white blood cells over the years as well and how they just were, were progressively kind of coming down. Um, but, but you couldn't see anything that my body was responding to, right? Not in my blood work. Um, DNA connections is you're looking at genetic uh, material. Uh, and so it's, it's th that particular lab, I know they question it because how can they, um, they have to do so much to show that anything is actually there. I think that's some of the argument with that lab, as well as just because something's been there doesn't mean that that's the reason that you're currently sick. So it's not a way to say that you're in a, it's an acute uh, infection or that that is actually what's responsible for why you're sick right now. And I just think um, it feels like too much of a reach. But the point is with the urine lab, um, and Dr. Klinker talk, talks about this, you really want to sauna, you want to make sure you exercise, you want to get a massage, you're trying to liberate the tissues and the joints so that you can get the microbe material to show up in, in the urine. Um, and I think you're just, you're looking at the body holistically instead of purely from the Western medical model. And whenever you do that, you're more likely to find what you're looking for. Dr. Tiffany, you just said something really powerful, I think, that there are many people who are listening today who have had multiple tests and come out negative, but they feel either they have a clinical diagnosis from a Lyme litter doctor, or they're just getting treated based on their symptoms. What are some other techniques that you can recommend for this various bacteria from a tick bite to come out so they can have a positive blood test to have those definitive labs to bring to their doctor? And 
And I think, you know, you have to understand how it works. So you're, you want to go looking for it where it lives. And um, so, so like I was saying, um, any sort of lymphatic flushing, anything you can do to move the lymphatic tissue because uh, lymphatic system rather, because that's where you're going to be able to pick it up. Um, so, you know, rebounding and things of that nature, um, the lymphatic massage, uh, sauna, infrared sauna, uh, to help the body move its fluids. Um, and then um, exercise. I have been blessed, and I think it's because of my fitness background, I have still been able to do some level of exercise throughout this whole journey. And so um, any sort of, um, you know, kind of any bouncing that you're able to still do, but also multiple limb movement patterns to just liberate the, the tissue. And that will help you to be able to find, Dr. Klinkhart is very clear on this. Um, you have to do something different to be able to help find it. So you just mentioned rebounding, which we've heard before, but I don't think is very well known in the Lyme community. Is that when, when Lyme patients will sort of like get a small trampoline and kind of jump gently on a trampoline to kind of get their lymphatic system moving and, all, and everything yes. moving so this bacteria will show up in their blood work and also help detox the kill off of this bacteria during treatment, right? Absolutely. I have to bounce every single day. So yes, I, I don't, my brain doesn't even, I, I use it for glymphat, um, glim, I can't even get it out, but glymphatic um, kind of detoxification as well. So getting the brain to do its detoxification, I can feel just with everything that's happened um, that my body needs a little bit more support to get that brain drainage. So it, it's not enough to even just sleep with my, my head elevated. I have to help daily to kind of flush my system. I, I would strongly encourage people to get a rebounder and start with just a few minutes every day because I know it can feel very taxing um, and, and just get a little bit of a, a bounce going on that, but it's a mini trampoline. And don't underestimate the power of pumping the arms and getting the arms and the hands over the head and trying to pick the knees up because that's a way to pump the lymphatic system as well. So let's talk more about now you got your diagnosis. What mm -hmm. did you do to actually treat your Lyme disease and co-infections once you had a positive test from DNA connections? <laughs> I bothered as many people in ICI as would listen to me. <laughs> so, um, so I can't. Um, the woman who's over, I'm having a problem with name finding today. So forgive me. Um, the woman who is over uh, beyond balance uh, just spent time with me, um, and I used her formulas to treat. Uh, I started with Bartonella. Because the way you do this, and, and I, I did some things a little out of order, and I, I haven't quite explained. I need to explain this. I treated the mycotoxin illness first. And so the way that I'm trained is that you, and this is very much in line with Dr. Neil Nathan, you get the mycotoxin illness out of the way first. So I have a small, you know, little portable sauna that I, I, I travel with this thing and every, everything. I did a lot of binders and um, glutathione and... Um, niacin. I used the 9-11 um, firefighters protocol to detox my system because I was very toxic. And Bartonella will do this, like the, all this immune suppression will make it so you have such a toxic floor. Before I started really killing anything, I really made sure that I was detoxing well. Um, I, you know, I escalated to using coffee enemas on a regular basis to, you know, increase my level of glutathione and keep things moving. So I was doing all of that the first part of 2019. And I had this issue too, where mercury filling was removed and I didn't know it was being removed. I, I didn't, I didn't realize that. And that really triggered a lot of my symptom response. So I was doing heavy metal detoxing as well. I did all of this map before I started trying to go after the Lyme disease. And I would recommend that people understand the concept of drainage and gentle detoxification and binding. It's not kill, kill, kill. It's, it's really clean up <laughs> and love on your body and heal and try to get the basic processes working before you start trying to kill things. But when I was ready, I started with the Bartonella and I used the Beyond Balance formula. Game changer. It immediately started feeling a difference. I had a hurt, but I felt a difference within the first month immediately. 
Dr. Tiffany, you mentioned niacin as a supplement, and we've heard this once before, but we don't hear it often, oh. where niacin, if you take that before you go into the infrared sauna, it can actually help make the process of detoxing even better in an infrared sauna if you take niacin. So can you speak more about that for our listeners? Mm -hmm. So, um, and this came from Dr. Mercola, uh, and he interviewed the person who was um, involved with this process, but it is literally the 9-11 for the first responders for 9-11. They were super toxic. And what you do is you take the niacin, um, I, I would take it a couple of hours before I was going to do the sauna. And I still will do this to this day. And um, there's a timing with the niacin and the glutathione and the binding and then getting in the sauna. But the idea is it just, um, it, it kind of opens up um, the blood vessels and gets this flushing response. You do want a flushing one. And that can be very uncomfortable with the itching and everything that can kind of show up with that, but you get used to that. But it, it just kind of opens up the system and just helps things to get moving. So we're trying to get everything moving along. You need lots of movement. It's not enough to just sit in the sauna. And I know that's uncomfortable for people This in the Lyme community, this, I need to move and I need to try to, you know, my body hurts and I, you're asking me to move it. Niacin is a way to get blood flow going and to expand and open up things so that when you go to do the infrared sauna, it can have a deeper effect. So it's been a huge part for me and it's very helpful with the cholesterol piece too, because that's been a problem for me. Dr. Tiffany, you also mentioned that you did coffee enemas, and we've had yes. a lot of conflicting opinions about coffee enemas from various guests, including doctors, um, mm -hmm. but many of our guests have had great success using coffee enemas. So can you talk to us about what your opinion is of the coffee enema and if it has helped you personally? I, um, I don't know. Some of these things, I, I don't know where I'd be mad if I wasn't doing them. So uh, again, emphatically, yes. And just because everyone hasn't caught up yet with the research on something doesn't mean anything is what I know very clearly. Um, but yes, coffee enemas help with the production of glutathione. Um, and um, it's just a way to kind of kick that liver to gallbladder um, connection there and, and flush the system along. I can go from feeling um, completely brain fogged and headachey and just not feeling well to completely shifting the whole day. And, um, and you don't use the coffee enema as an enema. So they're not being used to empty yourself out and have a bowel movement. Um, I encourage clients to, you know, we do something else to help with regular bowel movements if that's a problem. The coffee enema is purely a detoxification strategy um, and to help with glutathione production. And I think it's invaluable. So Dr. Tiffany, before we get into your herbal protocol in more detail, I want to ask that we've had a lot of guests who struggle with um, digestion and gastroparesis and things like that because of Lyme. And, and now they've healed in many other areas, but they're still struggling with that particular component. So what would you recommend for those people to help them with the ability to be able to eat more foods and not feel like it's just stuck in their stomach and they can't digest it and that they're, they're the way they describe it is like their stomach and their esophagus is almost like paralyzed. What would you recommend for those? Mm. Yeah. So, um, vagal tone is a huge player with this. And so when you start to, I mean, the, the vagus nerve is part of how you respond to your stressors. Right. And so we're in internally under attack. And so this whole, uh, fight, flight, freeze response is being managed with the vagus nerve that connects from the brain into the stomach. So you have to do rehab on your vagus nerve. So um, Dr. Karazian is a great um, uh, resource for this. And then Dr. Porges work uh, with the polyvagal theory. Um, I would recommend though, what they do to do this work is it's loud bellowing singing um, in the morning and in the evening or gargle water in the morning and the evening um, aggressively, you know, for um, a couple of minutes. And that starts to help with the, the vagus nerve uh, rehab. Um, I, I like cold laser or red light therapy um, in the areas for the vagus nerve as well as on the gut. Um, I like a heating pad. I do this for all the clients that come into my office. I put a heating pad on the gut 
and I take some sort of vibration, um, a vibe plate, and I put that against the stomach, and that's a way to help to rehab the vagus nerve. Um, you've got to get in there and work on the system um, and kind of understand the mechanics of what's gone wrong because that's part of where we are. I mean, there are things you can take to move your gut along. Um, and, and I think um, some of the things we talked about was rebounding. Infrared is really good too for people with getting their guts moving as well. Um, I think that's fascinating how those two kind of hang together. But vagus nerve would be a big one to make sure they're looking at. So I have to say, I've been for the past two months or so now, uh, because we've heard it from another podcast guest, and I didn't realize in what way it was actually helping me. But every morning I will gargle, and on the way to work in the car, I will literally just do like a <laughs> deep chant. And it sounds so weird, but I feel mm -hmm. so much better from it. So now it makes sense the way you just described it, why that's helping me in my healing journey. So it's great to hear that that's um, something we can do to help the vagus nerve and potentially gut issues for people that are struggling. So, mm -hmm. and I'm moving forward. So the, these herbs did help you. You did have mm -hmm. a little bit of a Herx reaction. So I think it's important to note for people that if they are going to start an herbal protocol to now kill off some of the bacteria once they've sort of cleansed their body, as you described, that mm -hmm. they need to ease into it and not let Herx prevent them from, you know, moving forward on a gradual basis with these herbs to feel better. Is that, is that something you'd recommend to people that to not walk away if they have a Herx reaction? Yeah, um, absolutely. I think you just, you need to expect it. Um, the book Toxic by Dr. Neil Nathan, I think is really helpful. And, um, I, you know, he's, he's in ICI and, and um, I've learned so much from his work. And um, he tells you when you use the BART formula from um, Beyond Balance, BART 1 and BART 2, um, that you're, if you have a Hertz, that's a great confirmation that Bartonella is even there right so this is this is not a bad thing sometimes and that you just back off to the dose that um you don't have the herx response at right so you know if it's if maybe you can only do one drop of something every other day and i, I can take full dropper fools of things these days you know because my body is in such a different place but if maybe you can only take a drop every other day and you just honor where your body is because it's telling you what it's up against and then you manage to hurt you take an epsom salt bath you get in the sauna you do some deep breathing you um you, I am a big fan of emotional freedom technique and tapping. You just love on your body and let it know that it's going to be safe. And you get right back in there and you do the level that you can handle. So Dr. Tiffany, can you talk to us about the wave two by free medical and uh, free medica and what yeah. that is and how it's helped you in your journey? So I, yeah, I, um, they're such a sweet company. I hear from them like all the time. So I just want people to know that they're a very hands-on company. Um, and I um, had heard of Yolanda Hadid's story and I spent, um, you know, the time like half of 2019 leaning hard into killing. So I got, I went after the BART and I went after the Ehrlichia and I used all the Beyond Balance program um, supplements and I did some Buner protocols for the Ehrlichia. Like I've done all these things and it was the beginning of this year. And as, as I, I just felt like, I don't know. I needed something else. I just needed a little, I was like, I can't live like this on all these drops and herbs and everything for the rest of my life. And I'm doing all these other things. And I, um, I said, okay, if I believe in light therapy and this residence makes sense to me and, um, they had a black Friday sale and I said, I am here for it. And I went ahead and bought my wave too. Um, and it has been, it changed. It, it was the next thing that kind of changed everything for me using the BART formula from beyond balance. My brain cleared and the speech problems I started having in 2019 stopped. And so that was that moment where I knew I was on the right path. And when I used the wave two, it was the same thing. Sleep has been beautiful. I can sleep through the night. Um, I don't use near. I don't use near the amount of supplements I used before. If I have to use um, my Beyond Balance herbs, it's maybe once a week if I'm a little symptomatic, and it usually tracks with my with ovulation and my my menstrual cycle. But I have almost a hundred percent been just using the Wave unit for the past like four months. So it's, it's for me, because I know it's not for everybody, it has for me been exactly what they claimed it would be. Um, it's been tremendously helpful. Can you talk to us in a little more detail about what it actually does to help treat and kill the Lyme bacteria and other co-infections? 
So it's this idea that everything operates on a frequency and we're up against this thing that we can't see. And, um, and with the herbs, the beautiful thing about herbs, it's different from the antibiotics, which I've never done is herbs are, are smarter and there's a wisdom to them and they will work with your body. And I think that's why the beyond balance worked for me. Um, but, but you do get some sort of, you get a reaction to the herbs, right? They can be a little toxic or hard for people. Resonance and light therapy is different. It particular, it specifically goes after the frequency that the Lyme or the bacteria or the parasites or whatever, you know, whatever treatment phase you're in is, is trying to kill. So it's a light therapy. It's a unit that you wear on your arm or your leg. Um, you wear it for eight hours a day. There are different phases. Um, so you literally hook your unit up to your computer and you say, okay, I'm ready to go to level two of detox and level two of Lyme killing and my 90 day protocol, and then level two of um, recovery for anxiety and mood. And you get to set where you are. And I had by the, now I'm at a point where I'm able to handle high levels, but I could tell when I took that, that system up to like a high level of killing for the Lyme disease, I, I had I had some some issues with it. It was really working hard a few times, and I could feel I was really worn out. But it's a it's a treatment that uses light and frequency um, to get into the system and to go after the infection. Is this technology similar to cold laser treatments? I have a cold laser. <laughs> I do not think it's the same. No, if, and if someone claims it's the same. Um, I would disagree. So you're using, you're using um, red and infrared because I use my laser that does not at all feel the way that the wave unit does. It's, um, it's, and you can put the laser on a frequency too, but this is different. It's almost like they took the light frequencies and they put it in a recipe. So it's like a, it's like a, it's a, there's a recipe for how to go after. It's like um, almost like music. And, or something like that. And it's, it's programmed in a, a certain way. And with cold laser therapy, it is not. So we have, we have protocols that we can follow, but it doesn't touch the experience that I've had with using the wave. Can you talk yeah. to us more about QNRT and EFT and how this has helped you heal? Yes. So and I'm, and I really would encourage people to take this part as seriously as they can and not, you know, not feel blamed as if, you know, there's some emotional piece that they didn't do right here, because I know within the chronic illness and the environmental illness communities, people can, can feel like, you know, we've been told that we have some sort of psychological issue or some mood issue and, and it's that and we're not really sick. I'm not saying that, of course. Um, I have a high ACEs score. So as lovely as my childhood was, there was a lot of stress and drama and problems during it. So I have um, a high adverse childhood experiences score. That made me way more vulnerable to succumbing to Lyme once my life got stressful later as well. QNRT, well, let me back out. Let me say this. I'm at an ICI conference and Dr. Neil Nathan is standing there and he says that Annie Hopper's DNRS approach is the reason that he is able to heal people. That unless you are doing something to change the nervous system, it is likely that you will never truly heal, right? So it's vagus nerve polyvagal theory and, um, and, and the DNRS, so dealing with the nervous system are how you help the body to reclaim its health. So I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this brilliant man and I'm in this room full of these brilliant people and he's saying that DNRS is the key. So I'm, I'm a little beside myself because at that time I know I'm sick and I, and I have not done DNRS and I talked to Annie Hopper and she's a beautiful, amazing person and um, I wanted something guys that wasn't just for me but that I could use with other people. And I didn't want to just give my people to DNRS, my client, my, my roster and my practice to DNRS. And I knew that because of the impairment that a lot of my clients have, and Dr. Neil Nathan speaks to this, they weren't going to do the duration that she requires for DNRS. And so I started poking around the functional medicine community and I found QNRT, which is a quanto, it's a it's quantum neurological reset treatment or therapy. And it's a nervous system reset. And it's a way to go in. And so it's a very complex 
process, but I could, I became trained in it. And you go in and you actually move out of the system, trap stressors, emotions, and you reset the nervous system. So I've had numerous resets myself. I credit it as part of my healing journey and I have used it with clients will come and it just, it changes everything for them. And it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful experience to do that with them. I use the EFT, which is emotional freedom technique, which is tapping in between appointments. Clients will do that and I will do tapping myself. And it's another brain body approach to help just restore the nervous system. So that, Dr. Tiffany, it sounds like you're giving us a recipe here for, for what was successful in your healing journey right because told us that first you had to cleanse the body you had to detox you had to take binders you had to you know address the mold and then you started going after the bacteria and now you're telling us that you had to in addition to killing the bacteria and cleaning your body you had to sort of reset your brain and your nervous system because it sort of got rewired as a result of chronic Lyme disease and chronic illness so is that sort of a, like a recipe at a high level you could put together for people that they need to address those four components if they Right, right. I um, in great summary, yes. <laughs> um, and and I can't take credit for. I have brilliant people that I've learned from. I mean, if you if you know Dr. Klinghart's work, he has a very similar kind of approach to things where you have to do you have to deal with past hurts and also look at the nervous system. But yes, um, I would say, and um, and this came from Dr. Nathan. QNRT and EFT really needed to have happened earlier in my healing journey to get my system ready for what was about to happen. Um, so I, I wish I'd known to do that earlier in my healing journey. So when I was cleansing, I also needed to be stabilizing my nervous system um, and doing all the tapping. Um, and then um, I did, I did something called, and I do this with my clients, called Safe and Sound Protocol by Dr. Porges. You know how we all have this light sensitivity and the sound sensitivity in this community? Guys, this has been just a, another life-changing moment doing SSP. It, it, it changed my brain and my hearing. So I don't have the same startle response. I don't, I don't have the reaction to the environment that I used to have. I would, I would take those modalities and I would couch them at the earlier phase of treatment. Though, I mean, I'm doing just fine and I did them later, but I would put them earlier on as part of the just, let's get the body ready. Because killing's not really the end all be all. You need to have a system that can handle life differently and so absolutely i would say you would you would kind of front load these things you you cleanse and drain and detox and then you slowly go through and you kill each thing in the proper order dealing with the thing that um the whatever's creating the most symptoms is what you kill first okay so for me it's been bartonella and erlichia it was Bartonella, Babesia, or Lichia, and then Borrelia burgdorferi. So that's how I did it. And then parasites and H. pylori because my floor was so toxic, and I just kind of systematically and gone gone through and killed them. So, Dr. Tiffany, you just have been brilliant in this interview. And I have one last question before handing it over to Rich because I just have been dominating your time. But I, I know that you did receive a lupus diagnosis as well after your Lyme diagnosis. And many people in the chronic Lyme community struggle. Do they, did their autoimmune disease cause chronic Lyme? Did chronic Lyme cause autoimmune? Or even is there a connection? So what is your opinion between the correlation of chronic illness like chronic Lyme and then developing an autoimmune disease like lupus or hypothyroidism or um, Hashimoto's or whatever it may be? Yeah, great question. Um, so quick and dirty, I absolutely think um, that the body does not all of a sudden start attacking itself. So um, I think there's always a stealth infection. We don't know what's there. And so the diagnosis of lupus is totally because my body is like, oh, there, th there's infection here. And then it just kind of indiscriminately started overreacting to things. Um, I do not believe that the lupus I know for a fact, I tested everything from 2016 to 2018. I tested for autoimmune disorders of every kind. I was looking for all kinds of things because of my symptoms. And none of that, none of those labs were positive. They weren't, they didn't start to show up and the lupus diagnosis didn't show up for me until 2020. And really, I just wanted my medical record to, to show for me the cleanup phase. 
So I, I pulled my neurologist into this. I said, let's get an MRI. Let's check out my brain. Let's just make sure everything looks okay from your perspective. Um, and I want to get in with the rheumatologist. And I want them to see everything um, just to have the traditional med medical community monitoring my health for, with their testing and their perspective of things. Um, and they all know that I believe everything is related to Lyme. They don't believe that and I don't need them to. Um, but but I absolutely think that the lupus is just my system finally understanding that the infection was there and just over responding to things. And I'm confident that that will calm down. I, I, have, I have faith that the lupus diagnosis is going to be something that I'm able to move through as well. So Dr. Tiffany, if you were to tell us um, or answer the question about whether or not you're in remission, do you believe you're in remission and do you believe that your health is back to 100% or where do you think you are? Yeah, that's a great question. I am close, but I don't believe I'm there yet. Um, I, I, you know, and it could be because of the way I live life. I, um, <laughs> you know, I'm not really sitting down resting very much. Um, and I have a lot of stress. I run a very busy practice with some high demand clients. Um, and I show up every day and I have not ever missed a day of work. Right. And that's a lot for a limey. Um, and so, um, maybe I would feel like I used to if my life was calmer and slower and easier. Um, but I, I, I am so much better than I was in 2018. Um, but I, I don't feel like I'm 100% out of the woods yet. And the way the free medical wave two works is with each six month period that you're on it, you just get more and more of your bandwidth back and that's how they teach you to expect it. So I just remain optimistic. And I think that, um, I also think, I want to say it this way too, there's a lot of cartilage damage for me. And so I have a lot of pain in my body from the ravages of what Lyme and the infections did. So part of what influences my response is I'm trying to put everything back together. I feel like there's a lot of collagen and, you know, I'm taking a lot of different things to just try to put my system back together. And I think once I get through that, I'll be able to say, yes, I'm, I'm back to where I was. So can you now talk to us about the beauty of Lyme? And one of the things that always surprises me when we're doing these interviews is that folks talk about how their lives are different as a consequence of their Lyme journey. And it's more beautiful in many ways. So can you talk to us about what has been good for you and the transformation you've made through this process of dealing with Lyme disease? Right. Um, yeah, and I, I think it's a strange thing. I, I've heard people say that as well, and it definitely resonates with me. Um, I found my purpose. So that's, that's one piece. I love working with people on having a better brain. That's, that's the focus of my practice. And I feel like my brain was really under attack during this, even with everything that happened with my body, the fog and the speech issues, the losing some of my brain's capacity was very scary for me. Um, and, uh, and my purpose is to help people have the best brain they possibly can and you know the best health and i think without lyme i don't know if this is the direction i would have gone with my work um the nervous system and understanding the impact of uh, developmental trauma and um conception trauma and how that sets us up to be vulnerable to having these health issues later in life i would have never gone down this path i always say god has a sense of humor it's like i want to find my purpose and i, I wasn't specific about how i was going to get there and so um i've really found a quieter simpler more, I feel like I let go of a lot of the superficial things in life and I've been able to find what's really important and I'm super grateful for that. And people really see me. So the people I work with um, give me back so much love because we're doing such important work. Um, I, I hear it all the time. The work you do is so important or what you've done with me in my life um, is, is so important. I just, that level of connection, I would have, I don't know if I would have been able to access that if it wasn't for Lyme disease. So how is your husband doing today? He's so much better. <laughs> um, Ehrlichia really, it, um, for me, it was white blood cells. For him, it was um, his liver and anemia, um, liver enzyme problems and, um, and anemia. 
and uh, mood dysregulation. He is, he is just a pussycat. He's a little teddy bear now. <laughs> He's so much calmer and easier. And, um, and he, he uh, is a little bit younger than me. And um, his energy and his strength were, were a little impaired before I really got a hold of what was going on with him. And he's really a lot more vital and energetic. And um, we're just, we often say to each other, we're in a good place. We're in a good place in our connection and our relationship and our health. And the, the best is really yet, yet to come for us. So Dr. Tiffany, I'd like to talk to you about one more thing that we started mm -hmm. to address offline. And I'd like you to talk to me about your perspective on diversity of immune systems and immune responses to different pathogens. So for example, we're seeing in the COVID arena that that women are doing better than men when they are coming in contact with the virus. And we're seeing younger people do better than older people. And we're seeing uh, white people do better than people of color. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's that same type of a diversity in the Lyme arena? And if so, why? Right. Um, yes. And we, and we were speaking about this earlier a little bit. And um, uh, one thing that I, I, I feel is it, with the African-American, the, the Black community is unfortunately health in the past has not been something I believe we were taught to manage as well and to know what to look for. And um, the way we love and connect is around food that has not always been healthy for us, just our practices with food and self-care. And I think that, and I don't think I said this earlier, Rich, but also I do believe develop, um, transgenerational trauma, right? Plays a huge part in this from a genetic perspective. And so you take all of that, so just these generations of, of not having great health practices, not knowing how to take care of oneself or knowing what, what a certain symptom means. Um, you take generational trauma, which is an epigenetic expression for people, which starts to turn on certain vulnerabilities. And then you take the fact that no one talks about Lyme disease, like we're not taught, we don't know. I don't know a lot of Blacks that, that are aware that Lyme could be the reason that they're having migraines or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's in our communities or like nobody's talking about this. And it's, you know, Bredesen has linked um, Lyme disease to t one of his types of Alzheimer's, right? And Parkinson's disease, but, but nobody knows this. So I think because of that, a lot of, a lot of Blacks just don't even know to think that they have Lyme disease. And you have my journey where no one even considered to look at that. And even when I say that, that, that that's what's happening, they won't call it that. How on earth would any of us know we had Lyme disease? How is it, how would we know that? And then we would, we would think it was something else and it could easily activate all these autoimmune issues like it has me and that's the diagnosis. But Dr. Tiffany, what I'm asking you is why does the black community seem to be so underrepresented in the people who are diagnosed with Lyme? You, you focused on why there may be some cultural issues about why people in the black community are not thinking Lyme themselves, but why mm -hmm. do you think the medical community is failing to diagnose people in the black community if in fact that's what's happening? Right. And I, I, um, I, I can only go with my own experience here with no one even has it on the radar. So see, I had to advocate for myself. So I had to advocate for myself. So if you have a patient that doesn't know what to WebMD and doesn't know that this could be the stealth infection that is creating this problem for them, then they're also coming in and they have a history of um, not taking care of themselves as well. If they're obese, if they have heart, you know, um, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, um, that noise gets in the way of somebody looking beyond that. Um, I, I just know so many people, we have a hard time within my community historically with self-care. And so obesity and all of these lifestyle diseases have really been a problem for us. So when you go into the doctor's office, what, what people would come back and say is they want me to lose weight. They want me to change my diet. Um, they're not listening when I say I'm tired or my back hurts or my head hurts. Um, they're thinking it's all of my self-care. 
And so then they're not being, no one's going beyond that surface issue. And then we don't know how to advocate for ourselves and know that that might be something to even say to a doctor. I, 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 I do think it's this piece of it because I had to fight really hard to get anyone to take this seriously. Now, do you think there's the, the possibility that mm -hmm. folks in the black community actually have a better or stronger immune system and that the genetic memory that is passed on uh, to folks in the black community allows them to have a better defense against a Lyme or tick disease invasion? I would, I would be hard pressed to believe that we would be stronger in this way. Um, and I'd have to look at the numbers. I don't know what the numbers look like when it comes to autoimmune disorders, um, because that's where I think you're going to find it in the black community. I think it's, I think it's all hiding there. I think all the fibro and all of the, I mean, and it's, it's inappropriate to say, I realize this, but looking at the breast cancer and some of these, like how much of, how much of all of that is actually Lyme and hiding? And then if we look at those numbers, I would be hard pressed to say that we're more resilient. I just, I don't, I don't believe that to be true, but that's me being anecdotal. For sure. And, and, you know, one of the things we've been able to identify through some of the work that some of the young doctors and medical students are doing is that in addition to doctors not being properly trained during their educational process, you included, quite frankly, mm -hmm. where, where you don't know a whole lot about Lyme, when, when people in the medical community are, during the educational phase, introduced to Lyme, they're, of course, introduced to Lyme generally through the rash on the skin. And they're only shown <laughs> images of white people with a rash. So there are some built-in challenges that are greater from a diagnostic standpoint. But I'm still not sure that that answers all the question. I think, uh, right. questions, and, and I think we have, to, we have to look more closely at whether or not uh, you know, diversity of, uh, of immune systems is playing a role here, because that may give us clues into how to resolve the problem. So um, I, I think this is a, a, a really fascinating topic. Yes. You're bringing so much, uh, you know, so much to this interview. And I have to ask you one last question. If sure. God forbid your husband came walking in to see you right after you finished his interview and he had a tick biting him under his arm, what would you recommend that he do so he wouldn't have to go on a second terrible tick disease journey the way he had before? Right. Yes. Then that would be a tragic experience that we hope does not occur. <laughs> but yes, um, we would, we would, I, I would remove it and get the area cleaned for him. And then we would send the tick off because that's, you know, the appropriate thing to do. We'd want to make sure we know what's going on with the tick. Um, and then I would lean into um, immune support for him. And I would do all the very same things I've already said. I would strengthen the body's reaction to this experience. So we would get him in the uh, sauna and we would increase uh, all of the immune support, his vitamin C and his vitamin D. And um, we've got a kind of an herbal blend that we use for immune support as well. So I'd strengthen him. Um, and then I, I'm gonna be honest, I would put him on just a very low level herbal support until I knew what was going on. Um, and I would laser. So I would laser where he was bit as well. We have a, um, in the laser that I work with, there's a couple of different frequencies for um, not specifically Lyme disease, but but different infections. And I would laser there and then just kind of help his thymus and the rest of his system kind of pull up. Thank you for listening to the Tick Bootcamp interview with Dr. Tiffany Brownbush. To our listeners, we have a call to action. First, if you'd like to learn more about Dr. Tiffany Brownbush and her tick disease journey, please visit her Instagram page at doc underscore brown underscore bush. That's D-O-C underscore B-R-O-W-N underscore B-U-S-H. Second, if you enjoyed this episode of the Tick Bootcamp podcast, please share it with your friends by using the social media buttons you see at the bottom of this post. Third, Tick Bootcamp has created a Tick by Blueprint that has been inspired by the information that has been shared with us by past guests on this podcast. We urge you to visit our website at www.tickbootcamp.com to view the blueprint. Please know we would appreciate any input or improvements you would like to offer to the blueprint. Fourth, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Spotify to get your automatic episode updates of our Tick Bootcamp podcast. And finally, please take a minute to leave us an honest review and rating on iTunes or on our website. Thank you, as always, for listening.